Hello, welcome to Mont Park Model Railway. In this video, I'll be sharing some of my observations of gradients during the process of building Mont Park Model Railway. For a little background, the design of Mont Park Model Railway is based upon my uncle's large HO layout, which I frequently visited over 30 years ago. It is estimated to have been five, five and a half metres by two and a half metres in size from photos and appeared to have almost four levels as shown in these photos. Since the days of running trains on that layout, I had dreamed of or one day building my own layout based on a similar design. During 2017, an opportunity presented itself by way of an, an empty spare room in our house, so the Mont Park Model Railway began. One of the design's constraints is the physical area of the room, which provided sufficient space for a three metre by three metre layout. I reworked my uncle's layout design until it fitted into the available space, but still in most part keeping to the overall running track schema and reducing it to two levels. And also with the assistance of a good friend of mine who also helped me with the electrical zoning and point locations. Not having built my own layout before, I spent some time researching different aspects such as gradients. The general consensus to, appeared to be that a 2% gradient was about right for HO00 model railways. Even though I was not sure of the consequences of running my trains, but adopted the 2% gradient as a general design principle. A good resource that I used was the NMRA, Australasian Region Education Program Basic Skill Series, um, Module 3 Layout Planning. And there's a link to their website in the comment section. It helped me with the design and subsequently building by using a 500 millimeter by 500 millimeter grid and frame. To maintain a 2% gradient, there should only be 10 millimeter change in gradient within each grid, or only 10 millimeters every 500 millimeters. My layout is, is a freestanding frame and not attached to any walls. This is because I wanted to be able to view the layout from all four sides. This diagram shows the layout with the gradient heights indicated in millimetres with blue numerals. Noting in this diagram, the upper level is at 70 millimetres. As I began construction of Mont Park Model Railway, it became apparent there were a few aspects I had overlooked. First, I had spaced the second level to be only 70 millimetres above the first, unwittingly not allowing for the 12 millimetre thickness of the baseboard itself. So I had to recalculate and adjust all the gradients leading up from one level to the next. The second is, the first half of the climb at the top of the diagram is over a two metre length, whereas the second half of the climb at the bottom of the diagram is half a metre shorter. So we needed to climb the same height over a shorter distance. Safe to say my original intended gradient of 2% was now in some places pushing up towards a 3% gradient. By the time the initial build was completed, there were already a few changes that included an increase in the complexity and detail of the diagrams. This diagram showing the upper level now at 80 millimetres. Up until a few months ago, I'd run the layout as per the original build. 
all the LICOs would climb the gradient in the, on the up line from Newark to Peterborough consistently and without issues, which is built as per the original design principle of a 2% gradient. However, most slowed to some degree as they climbed up climbed the up line from Peterborough to Litchfield. The 30-year-old locos would often struggle with a rake of three coaches and anything but full throttle. This climb was 38 millimetres in 150, sorry, 1,500 millimetres or a 2.5% gradient. And many would also race down the gradient when returning on the downhill back to Peterborough. When I started the initial build, the thought had been that trains would only be three car rakes, but things developed and some more modern locos appeared on the layout. It became evident that five car rakes were easily possible, which in turn resulted in lengthening of all the station platforms to suit. Longer trains also led to, led to implications of gradients and curves and the drag that longer rakes inherently have. So what does a 2% gradient look like? Hopefully this picture provides a practical representation. For every 500 millimetres of distance travelled, the track rises or descends 10 millimetres. So a 2% gradient or a ratio of 1 in 50 or a fraction of 1 50th. What have been the changes I have needed to make over time to reduce the adverse impacts of gradients on Mont Park? The following diagram provides an indication in red highlighter a number of sections that have had their gradient reworked since the original build in 2017. As can be observed on the diagrams, as well as changes to straight lengths of track, are also some change required to adjacent curve sections. What I had not fully appreciated in the beginning is the impact curves have on the running of a train and subsequently the adverse impacts of gradients and of curves together. Let us look at a, a flat section of curved track. Take the middle track and make some measurements of the photo and the length of the, the inside rail of one section of track. And on this photo is approximately 331 millimetres. So just to explain that, I'm not taking the actual physical measurements of the track, I'm just taking the measurements on this photo itself. Now let's measure the length of the outside rail of the same section of track, which is approximately 343 millimetres. So now we can see for one section of curved track between two locations it measured just differently for the inside and outside rail. So what is the issue or what is the impact of the inside rail being a different distance to the outside rail? Now let's look at a, a typical train axle that is not dissimilar to their prototypical versions where the two wheels are joined together with a fixed axle. Sorry, that was a very nasty plastic version which we'll come back to later. The metal version looking slightly more attractive. If we have a pair of wheels joined together on a fixed axle and they must move through a curve that are different distances between the length of the inside rail and outside rail, something has to give for them to both arrive at the destination together. If the inside wheel binds to the rail, then the outside wheel will likely need to slip over the outside rail or slide, or the outside wheel binds to the rail, the inside wheel will likely need to skip over the inside rail. A small amount of slip or skip creates friction or drag, which for a single axle might be very small. However, the length of a long train with 
is multiplied and compounded by the total number of axles. This is all normal for any train. However, there are other factors that can exacerbate the problem. Let's have another look at the plastic wheel in the comparison to a metal version. The metal version is shiny, whereas the plastic version is dull, likely imposing more resistance when the slip or skip needs to occur, and thus providing greater drag. The plastic versions also have a wider surf surface area, again, more likely to provide greater resistance when that slipping or dragging occurs. It is possible to lessen the impact of curves by using wider radius curves, wherever possible. If we measure the previous photo for all three radius, it is then possible to calculate the percentage difference of the outside rail in comparison to the inside rail. In this photo, the inside track, the second radius curve, the outside rail is 5.37% longer than its inside rail. The middle track, or third radius curve, the outside rail is 4.23% longer than its inside rail. In the outside track, or the fourth radius curve, the outside rail is only 3.7% longer than its inside rail. The conclusion here is to use a wider radius curves wherever possible because there's less um, drag that needs to happen in a particular corner. Of course, the good news is the larger the radius curve, the lesser the impact and occurrence of drag. So that was for one single axle, which for the average coach, it has four axles. However, what happens if there are multiple axles and they are linked together so they all had to move in unison? So they do, as they do on a steam loco drive wheels. Steam locos come in many different axle combinations. Possibly the most common for English steam are the two axle, such as the 440, or the three axle, such as the 462, and the four axle, such as the 282. As the number of coupled axles increase, the inherent drag also increases. This is due to, just because one axle needs to have that small amount of slip or drag, this is in effect that all of those axles have to do that at the same time. And so if they've got a very tight curve for a six actual steam loco, then that's uh, one thing other than the bend itself, but also that slipping and dragging, that friction that occurs. So where is all this going, you be, may well be asking. When considering gradients for model railways, there can be other factors other than the gradient itself, which can impact on how the trains will run up and down the gradients. Some of the factors can be the gradient itself. My experience is for rising gradients, 2% or less is best place to start. Another is the type of wheels, plastic or metal. The radius of the curves. The wider the radius, the less the impact. The gradient change through a curve will have a greater impact as the same gradient on a straight section of track. The type of rolling stock, especially those that have linked or coupled axles, such as steam locomotive, which as the number of linked axle increases, so does the, the impact of trying to go up a gradient through a tight curve. And finally, where there is a combination 
of all of these, it can lead to poor running. Once I had finished regrading several of the mainline gradients on the Mont Park Model Railway, I found it was then possible to run trains at other speeds other than flat out. It seems to be more satisfying to be able to run trains at varying speeds and dare I say it at more prototypical speeds. In the long term, the harder a loco needs to work through its journey, it will likely have an at some adverse impact on its lifespan. Well, that's all there is for this month's video, and thank you for watching.